There's kayak gatherings on September 19th and October 3rd at 12 noon. There's men's Zoom prayer on also on September 19th and October 3rd at 7 p.m. There's a trail life gathering on September 26th at 9.30 a.m. There's a women's prayer meeting and gathering on September 26th also at 11 a.m. Youth group will meet on October 1st at 7 p.m. And some of you know uh, Sonny Winthrop, um, who's gone on to be with the Lord. On October 2nd at 10.30 a.m., we're going to have a celebration of life um, celebration for her. So if you could join us. Um, Sonny was just a wonderful, absolutely fabulous sister in Christ who's gone on to be with the Lord. So if you could spare some time and are open for that day on October 2nd at 10.30 a.m. It would be great for us to come and celebrate her life. Um, so please do that. There's a men's fireside Bible study on October 2nd also at 7 p.m. here at the church. And for the elders, there's a meeting of the elders um, on October 4th at 6.30 uh, p.m. I have also been asked to um, share, and interestingly enough, Sonny Winthrop, um, was the head of our ministry, so she was often telling us what was going on with the people that we are fortunate enough and blessed enough to share with around the world who bring the truth of the gospel um, to people all around the world. So I have two updates for you on ministries, one for um, Mexico and one for Costa Rica. Um, our ministry that we support in Mexico is the Rancho del Rey, which is a... Uh, a ministry for young boys whose families can't take care of them. And during the school year, the government will send them to the school. Um, we got an email from Susan Mino from Rancho Del Rey, and she tells us that they are, um, they are getting ready for the new year. They're doing deep cleaning. Um, they're, they've got a new psychologist, Daniel, who they're excited about who can help the boys. Um, they actually have their waiting, and so if, if if in support, we can, we, I know we support them financially, but she asks for prayer. She said that there are 16 potential new proposed um, boys to come to Rancho Del Rey. So if we can keep them in prayer, that those 16 boys, uh, God might open the door for them to be able to come to Rancho Del Rey and get an education and get spiritual guidance that they need um, because they don't have a heck of a lot. Um, they also asked for prayer uh, for the boys from a colony, Riberas del Rio. Um, apparently there's been an outbreak of COVID there, and in addition to that, the worldly ways have gotten in. There's a lot of um, criminal activity, and obviously the boys are susceptible to that. So they've asked for prayers for the 16 new candidates, as well as the boys in that particular providence. So I think that, you know, prayer, um, you know, God hears our prayers. If we could pray for those boys, that God puts his hand in hedge of protection on those boys um, so they can attend Rancho Del Rey and also the boys that are, are subject to, um, you know, ungodly and worldly things, that God would put his hand on those boys and direct them towards him. Um, also, Aaron from CRU, um, he was here um, a few months back. He went to Costa Rica and, um, and there's a more, there's a fuller information posted on the back. Lisi has posted on the back if you're interested. And obviously we're, we're supporting these ministries and we're fortunate enough to be able to do that. So if you want to know more about it and be thoughtful and specific in prayer, you can ha get more information. I'm just kind of um, giving you a thumbnail sketch of the emails that we've gotten. Aaron was over in Costa Rica and um, praise the Lord. He, I guess he went to an Airbnb and there was two young men who were kind of um, watching over the property for their parents. And slowly but surely over the time that the ministry was there, um, I think it was, no, it was their aunt and uncle, they were watching the property, obviously checking on it. And as the team stayed in Costa Rica, um, slowly but surely Aaron and his team were able to share the gospel with these two young men. And at the very end, although they were leaving, they were constantly invited to join in the activities and at the end, the men slowly but surely got closer and closer and joined them. And I guess there's some of the ministry team that's going to stay. So it was a wonderful um, story from Aaron about how he was there to share the gospel. 
and these two young men who were watching over the property, you know, God knew obviously, they were able to share the gospel um, with these boys. And one of the things that he said, and I think this is important, he, he says, it is necessary to share the gospel, and I believe that it is possible to do so through building relationships with people. And although he's in a ministry over in Costa Rica and he meets these people, um, I think we have to remember that we have influence on people in our lives um, that other people may not be able to reach. So we should keep in the forefront of the mind how, how in our hearts how good God has been to us and that we should share, like my experience today, you know, I, I could share that with people when they're so anxious and nervous. I can say, well, I woke up with peace because of God, because his promises are everlasting and never changing. Um, so I think Aaron's story can remind us that we all have somebody, whether it's a fellow student or somebody at the coffee shop or somebody at work, we always have an opportunity and maybe we should, you know, think about the relationships we have with people. Um, and as people get to know and trust us and see who we are in Christ, we can get to share that with, with them. Um, he also makes some great um, book recommendations. So if you want to look at the full story back on the board in the back in the, in the Welcome Center, at least he posted that. Lord, thank you for this time together. Please open our hearts and minds. Please, you know, clear everything worldly from our thoughts and just let us be receptive to your word this morning. I pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You can greet, please greet the people around you. Say hello to somebody. Just real quick, uh, rather than the 26th for the women's thing and the uh, trail life, it's actually the 25th this coming Saturday. So we're not running a women's thing during trail life during the morning service. Yeah, huh. just, all right. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name.
show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, the mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, the mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. All the earth you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request. Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? every thought over every word may my life reflect the beauty of my lord cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing so won't you reign in me again Lord, reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour you are the lord of all I am, so won't you reign in me again, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are truly of all I am, so won't you reign in me again, won't you reign in me again. There is an allness, a fullness of ourselves that we are called to give to you. We cannot give ourselves half-heartedly to you and expect to see you working to the fullness of your capabilities in our lives when we are only giving ourselves half-heartedly. So Lord, when we say reign in us, Lord, we mean reign through all of us reign through every part of us. May there not be a part today of our lives that we are withholding from you, a problem that we are keeping back from you, or an area of our lives, school, work, or play, friendships, peaks, valleys, that we somehow are saying to ourselves, Lord, you take care of everything else. We'll handle this. Lord, may we be giving all of ourselves to you today. And as we do, Lord, may we understand the promise of your word that says that all of you is what we need. All of you is what we get when we give all of ourselves to you. May we do that even as we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. I will 
a simple one sentence thing that you want to praise the Lord for today. You can, you can word it like this. I praise the Lord for go ahead and just call that out even from our seats this morning. Amen. We praise you Lord for life. Amen. We praise you Lord for our friends. Protection. Lord we praise you for your protection of us. Grace and mercy, Lord, we praise you for your grace and mercy. Healing. Say that again, ma'am. Healing. healing, Lord, we praise you for your healing. For your provision. provision, we praise you, Lord, for your provision. Courage. For truth, for courage, Lord, we praise you for truth. We praise you for courage. Amen. For this church, amen, we praise you, Lord. You are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are life, you are peace, even in my suffering. All right, we're going to start over. I need you in the back to be on the screens, please. Thank you. You are good, you are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love. Play for all to see. You are light, you are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace. When my fear is crippling, you are true, you are true. Even in my wandering, you are joy, you are joy. You're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, and you 
Death has lost its sting. Oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world. to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever reign. My heart will sing, no other name, Jesus. Jesus, my heart will sing, no other name, Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing, no other name.
Jesus, Jesus. Lord, your word says that it is like honey to our lips. Your word also says that the word very name of Jesus this morning, Lord, be like honey to our lips, like water to our thirsty and thirsting souls. Feed us now, Lord, please, through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Kids, you're dismissed for Calvary Kids. All right, got my headset on, all hooked up, okay. May I take your order, please? <laughs> hey, let's take our Bibles and open up together to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8. Our goal for this morning is to get through the whole uh, chapter. We're going to pick up in verse 13 uh, and get through verse 27. I'm not sure we'll meet our goal this morning, but that is going to be our aim, something weird is going on with my voice just in the last few minutes too, so add that to the poison ivy and woohoo, it's a great day. So I get poison ivy like once a year. I thought I made it through the whole summer. I did make it. I made it through the whole summer months without getting it. Fall starts in what? Two days? And I got it right in the very last possible week. And I got it in like the weirdest spot. I'm not going to show you. Relax, all right? So I'm not going to show you. But I got it in the weirdest spot. I got it on the inside of my forearms. I don't know what, you know, I, what did I pick up like this, you know, that I would have gotten it there. Most people who do weeding, and I don't, don't weed like this, right? Or walk around like this to get it in. It's just matching spots, you know? Now I just made them a little bit more itchy because I touched them together, so... Keep me in prayer for that, if you would. Hey, Daniel chapter 8, we're going to pick up in verse 13. Daniel is having visions, plural. Fortunately for us, the one here in chapter 13 is a little bit easier to understand and follow. Actually, I probably should say better for Daniel <laughs> that this one in, in chapter, uh, did I say chapter 13? What? Verse 13. Yeah, thank you. Good. Thank you. You want to preach the rest of the sermon? No, because you have a... Never mind. Um, it, here in Daniel chapter 8, fortunately for Daniel maybe in some ways, in some ways it's easier to understand. Now we already understand some things about it that Daniel doesn't, but our reasoning for that is we jumped ahead a little bit last week to verses 20 and 21. So we know what verses 20 and 21 say. We'll read them again together this morning when we get there, but Daniel doesn't know that yet. All Daniel knows is this. He has a vision... And in the vision, there is a ram. And that ram is, is powerful and strong and seems to, in a violent manner, take over much of the world. But along comes a goat, not along comes a spider. That's something completely different. And I don't like spiders, so we're not going to talk about that. But along comes a goat. That goat has one horn. And the goat is moving so fast, it looks like a cartoon. Its feet are not touching the ground. Remember in Roadrunner, you know, you never really saw the Roadrunner's feet touch the ground. It was just like a whir. Well, that, that's what's going on with this goat. And the two begin fighting with each other. And the goat winds up beating the ram and taking over everything that the ram had control of and some more, some more of the world. But the ram in its height of its power dies, or the horn, I should say, I'll put it this way, the horn that's on the goat, excuse me, the goat in the height of its power with that one horn, the horn breaks off. We're told it's a king, it's a king who dies. And now that, that empire, that kingdom gets split 
between four generals. One of those generals takes over uh, an area that includes present-day Syria, and at some point a descendant of that general, history tells us, decides that he's going to make a beeline for what Daniel chapter 8 calls the glorious land, and what we decided together last Sunday is just another word for Israel. This, this king makes a beeline for the nation of Israel. Somewhere right around 171 B.C. to around 165 B.C., he decides that he's going to persecute the Jewish people. Now, some of it he does in person, but for part of it, he's down in Egypt kind of taking care of that part of his kingdom and yet still is persecuting the Jewish people for no other reason than that they worshiped God. He eventually destroys their temple. In fact, he does something that, that is abominable in their temple when he takes a pig and he slits the pig's throat and he spreads the blood of that pig all over the sanctuary. Pigs are not kosher for the Jewish people. There was no way at that point that they could continue to worship in the temple. And so now he cancels their worship. He, he does something abominable in their temple. And now their temple is going to sit there desolate. So sometimes you might hear what he did referred to as the abomination of desolation. It was an abomination and it left the temple desolate. And his goal, in its place, instead of having people worship the Almighty God, was to get them to worship him. He believed that he was God walking the earth in human flesh. Daniel is seeing all of this. He doesn't even understand yet everything that I explained to you. But let's pick up now in Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. Here's what it says. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who is speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. I don't know if you picked up on it or not, but we just dropped into the middle of a conversation between two beings, both referred to as holy ones. And I'm not sure that there's a Bible commentary out there that doesn't agree that these holy ones are actually angels. Now, we're going to meet angel, another angel a little further as we move through the text, but this isn't two people talking about what's going on. These are two beings. And I want you to notice something right at the beginning of verse 13. Look at it with me. At the beginning of verse 13, it says that Daniel heard the holy ones speaking to each other. He doesn't see them, and yet something in the way that they're speaking tips Daniel off to them being some kind of holy, and we might say angelic, being. And that got me thinking a little bit, guys, to be honest with you, because you and I are called by God to be holy as he is holy. How many have heard that before? Yeah, that's a common thing. We hold on to it. It's a quick verse to memorize too, right? Be holy as I am holy. It's like five or six words, boom, done. Got a Bible verse memorized. But what does it mean? Well, part of what it means, and we're not going to unpack all of it, but part of what it means is that when you and I speak as, as people who are desiring to be holy the way that God is holy, people should be able to hear holiness in what we say. And, and what I mean by that isn't like, oh, well, I kind of have a nasal voice or I kind of have a deep voice. Or, no, no. It's not the volume of your voice. It's not the inflection of your voice. Rather, it's what's coming out of our mouth. There is a problem today, including in our church, when Christians talk like non-Christians. Do you understand what I mean by that? 
when, when our language as those who are seeking to be holy as God is holy is no different than those who are unholy and those who have no problem tossing out certain words. Now, let's be perfectly honest, or, or I'll be perfectly honest, whether you are or not, it's up to you. I'll be perfectly honest. In the times that I've had bad things happen to me quickly, like hitting my hand with a hammer or, you know, injuring myself in some way or uh, falling down a flight of stairs, there are words that come out of my mouth that should not in those moments come out of my mouth. All right? So this isn't like, oh, yeah, you holy... No, no, no. I'm right there with you. Right there with you, you know? Some guy cuts me off, okay? Uh, weaving as, well, as he's weaving, or I'm weaving, he would say me, right? Weaving in and out of traffic or whatever the case may be on the highway and he cuts me off or he slams on the brakes. There's not nice thoughts going through my head in that moment. And if it comes out of my mouth, it's often not nice words coming out of my mouth in that moment. And so I say that to say that's something I need to confess because what the Bible says is that shouldn't be happening. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, listen to what it says. No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. That's Ephesians 4, 29. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, there's a short list of things that you and I as Christians are to put off from our lives. Part of that list is filthy language from our mouth. It's just not supposed to be a part of the way that we talk. Well, everybody around me is talking that way. I get that. We, we understand that. But they're of the world. And even if they're not of the world and they would claim Christ, that doesn't make it okay. And listen, we're not talking just about like, like the most serious four-letter words. I've heard in conversations with, with even within our church, words like damn and hell being tossed out as like regular part of the conversation. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I think God has an issue with that. And I think we should have an issue with that too. That it's not like, well, I just don't say these. I say these. No, 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 no. Hell is a real place. And when we use hell in an improper way in conversations with other people, with Christians or non-Christians, we're changing the very definition of it. Uh, and what I mean by that is we're, that's not what I meant. We're changing the weight of the word. Because hell is a real place. And people who die apart from Christ will spend eternity in hell. And so if part of my conversation is something bad happens and I say, well, what the hell? Do you see how I just completely took away from the real meaning of the word? And listen, I didn't mean to offend anyone. I hope I didn't. I'm just, I'm not going to use the other words, okay, as an example. But damn is another one, right? Dam is another one that actually has and carries heavy biblical weight. And some of us throw it around like it's part of our regular everyday conversation. People shouldn't need to see us to know that we're working on holiness in our lives. They should just be able to hear us like Daniel hears these two and just know that's a person who is serious about becoming more like the Lord. Be holy as I am holy. But I want you to notice something else about these, these holy ones. They ask a question of one another. And, and I point that out because sometimes we as Christians, we make this mistake. We attribute the quality or, or the characteristics of God to other spiritual beings. In other words, God is all present right? He's, he's ever uh, uh, omnip, omnipresent. There we go. He's omnipresent. He's present everywhere. Angels are not. God is all-knowing. Angels are not. And that's why here we have one holy one, an angel, asking another angel, hey, what Daniel just saw, how long is it going to go on for? Angels are not all-knowing. They're, they're not God. They're not, they're, they're spiritual beings who sometimes in Scripture take the form of a human being. That's interesting, right? There's a verse, I think it's in Hebrews, it says, listen, 
show kindness to strangers, I'm paraphrasing it, show kindness to strangers because you never know when you may be entertaining an angel. Wow. So in Scripture, angels show up as people, and they come and they go at the Lord's bidding. But they're not all-knowing, they're not ever-present, they're not omniscient, or anything like that. It says here that the question that's being asked is, how long is this stuff going to go on? And notice there's an answer to it in verse 14, for 2,300 days, the then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Uh, by Daniel's calendar and the calendar of the Jewish people, that's six years and roughly three months. So a little, like six and a quarter years. Now here's what's interesting. In 171 B.C., September of 171 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes begins his persecution of the Jews. And that lasts until December of 165 B.C. You know what that is? Six years and three months. Isn't that cool? And, and some of you are like, oh, some of you like love stuff like that. You're like, oh yeah, give me more, give me more. Others of you are like, eh, it's okay. It's for those of you who are like, oh yeah, I love stuff like that. That's fine. Secular history confirms what the Bible teaches. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Now, I want to read you this cool verse from uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. This is 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 12. 1 Peter 1, 12, it's talking about the gospel. It's talking about how you and I have had the gospel preached to us, and, and it mentions the involvement of the Holy Spirit in that. And then at the end of the verse, it says that angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. Angels, some other translations say, desire to look into these things. So here, here's what's letting us know. Angels are learning about salvation. They're learning about grace. They're learning about mercy. And they're doing it all by watching God's interaction with us. Isn't that cool to think about? It'd be like, you know, if you were watching, I don't know, a, a cooking show to learn how to cook or a sewing show to learn how to, do they have sewing shows? I don't know, that's a weird example. Or watching somebody work on a car to learn how to work on a car. Watching a, an instructional YouTube video of any kind to learn how to do it. You're not doing it yourself. You don't know how to do it yourself. You're just trying to learn. And that's what angels are doing as they watch God's interaction with us. I, I, there's, in my mind anyway, there's times when the angels must be scratching their heads going, wait a minute, God. You forgave him? You showed grace to her? God, don't you remember yesterday when they blew it? And they blew it again today. And God says grace and mercy and forgiveness. And the angels are just soaking it all in and learning from that what God is like. You've probably heard before this verse from Luke chapter 15. I think it's verse 10 or verse, it's verse 10. Luke 15, verse 10. Uh, that Luke 15 is the chapter of the lost things. It's the, story, it's the chapter that holds the story of the lost son, who we often refer to as the prodigal son. It's the story of the chapter of a woman who loses, uh, of a widow who loses her might, not her strength, but her money, her coins. And in that one, at the end of that one, it says she sweeps the whole house and, and she finds it. And she's so excited that she invites all of her friends and neighbors over. And with joy in their presence, she says, you know what? I found what was lost. And there's joy in the presence of her neighbors because she's so excited about what's going on in her life. And the very next verse says in Luke 15, verse 10, that there is joy in the presence of the angels in heaven over one sinner who repents. Now, I have always taken that verse that when one sinner comes to the Lord, the angels are like, woohoo, party time. But when you combine it with Scripture, with other Scripture, that angels are learning about grace, they're learning about forgiveness, 
than what it means perhaps when it says that there's joy in the presence of the angels doesn't mean the angels are filled with joy because they're just learning. It means that heaven itself, God himself, Christ himself is filled with joy in the presence of the angels like the widow who invites the neighbors over because she's so excited about what's going on. They may have been a little bit excited, but they couldn't have the joy and the excitement that, that, that the widow had. They weren't looking for it. They didn't find what was lost, but she did, and she was excited in their presence. God is seeking those whom are lost. And when he finds them, he is filled with joy. And he invites the angels, and in their presence, he's excited, he's filled with joy, and they may get it a little bit as they're learning, but it's not that the angels are always having a party themselves. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, when we start looking at Bible verses about angels, it kind of changes how I picture them. It kind of changes how they're often portrayed. I mean, most of the angels that we see, right, they're, they're, they're white, uh, or they're wearing white. There's a glow about them. Uh, they, they, look, uh, they look pleasant, right? They look, um, uh, you know, like someone you would walk up to and and start talking to, or, you know, like nothing to be afraid of, or anything like that, but when you start reading in scripture what happens to almost every single person who comes into contact with an angel, what do they do? They fall flat on their faces. Some of them pass out. Some of them just faint. They're not like, oh, look at the cute little angel, you know? Look at him with this little bow floating on a cloud. No, 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 no. That's not what the Bible teaches. Now watch what happens here. So we have this understanding that, that for a set period of time, 2,300 days, something is going to happen in Jerusalem that's going to lead to the destruction of the temple and then, and then there's a definite time when that difficulty ends. And aren't you glad this morning that there is a set and definite time when difficulty ends? It doesn't feel like it in the middle, does it? It feels like this is going on forever, kind of like the sermon. But, but, you know, there is a definite time for difficulties to end. And so they come to an end. But that's not anywhere near the end of the chapter. In fact, the intrigue even increases. Verse 15 of Daniel chapter 8 says, Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning. I love that. He saw, and when he didn't understand what he saw, what did he do? He sought. I see, I don't get it, so I'm going to seek. Well, there's something to learn there, guys. I am guilty at times of picking up my Bible and going, man, I don't get this, and shutting it, and walking away like, oh, well, I don't get it. But what Scripture tells us, what Daniel is showing us, is we see, and when we don't understand what we see, when what we're reading doesn't immediately click with us, we don't close ourselves off, we push more. We seek, we seek. And that's what Daniel's doing. Verse 15 again. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, that's a river, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Okay, this just got really cool, all right? So if you're a little bit of a Bible geek, here we go again, all right? Verse 15, we have an angel appearing. He's definitely an angel. And oh, by the way, we, we learn his name, and his name is Gabriel, that's right. He's one of only three angels named in the Bible. Number one, Gabriel, that's the easy one. Number two is Michael, the archangel. And number three is Lucifer. That was his name when he was an angel. Now you and I can't think of Lucifer without thinking of the devil, right? Because when he fell, that's what he became. But here, Daniel now is not just hearing a voice or the voices of holy ones 
he actually is laying his eyes on an angel that shows up as a man, and then he hears a voice. But look where it says that voice is coming from. It doesn't say that voice is coming from the bank of the Ulai River. It says that that voice is coming from in the middle of the bank of that river. Well, if we have a bank over here and a bank over here and the river in the middle, that's where the voice is coming from. So is somebody swimming in the Ulai River that starts? No. Psalm 29 verse 3 says that the voice of the Lord is above the waters. I love that. And I think that's who's speaking here. The voice that Daniel hears, I believe it's the Lord. And I believe it's the Lord because the voice is telling Gabriel what to do. And we have to understand that God commands the angels. That they don't command each other. Nowhere in scripture will you read one angel telling another angel what to do. It's always God commanding the angels. Um, it's almost like uh, in... in um, Joshua chapter 1, where, where this, this being shows up, and he, he's dressed in full armor. And so Joshua says to him, well, are you for us, or are you for our enemies? And he says, neither, but as commander of the Lord's army. The Lord's army. What's that? I may never march in the infantry, right? You guys remember that song? Ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never zoom o'er the enemies, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. How many remember that song? All right, six of you. Great. I just made an idiot of myself for the rest. Thanks so much. Um, uh, 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 the, the Lord's army is an unseen army. You can't see it with your physical eyes, but you get glimpses of it in the in the Old Testament. Uh, Elijah, Elisha. At one point, I always get those two mixed up. They had that moment. At one point, uh, I think it was either in Joshua or Judges, it said there was the sound of an army marching in the tops of the trees. That is so cool. That's the Lord's army. God's the one who commands the angels. And here we have a voice commanding Gabriel what to do. Now listen now. There is a tip-off when as soon as we read that this is Gabriel involved, it should serve as a tip-off for us. Because there's only one time, every time that Gabriel shows up, not one time, every time that Gabriel shows up in the Bible, Old Testament or New, he has one message. And it always has something to do with Jesus himself. Think about it. He's showing up here to Daniel. We'll see it in a later chapter of Daniel as well. And so ultimately, this message that he's uh, giving here that's going to finish up later is somehow going to point us to Jesus. But the angel Gabriel also showed up to a young woman named Mary in the New Testament. And what did he tell her about? Jesus. That same angel Gabriel appears to Joseph in a dream and speaks to Joseph because God sent him to do that and talks to Joseph about Jesus. Every time, every time, every time Gabriel shows up, there's some kind of a direct connection to Christ. So, watch Daniel's reaction now to this. Daniel chapter 8, verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Keep going, verse 18. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood me upright, and he said, look, I'm making known to you what will happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time, the end shall be. Two times, well, three if you count the latter time phrase, three times in just a couple of verses, this angel Gabriel begins speaking to Daniel, and he says to Daniel, Daniel, you know what? Part of understanding this vision 
is understanding what's going to happen at the end. The end? The end of what? Well, he clues us in a little bit when he throws in that phrase, latter times. Or maybe your translation says, last days. Something just happened. Daniel's been, uh, sees this vision and, and, and it has a near fulfillment in a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes that we've already mentioned. Antiochus, just remember that part. Antiochus and Antiochus and what he's going to do and what secular history says he's going to do. But when Gabriel shows up, we automatically know that somehow it's about Jesus and there was nothing about Antiochus that was about Jesus because Jesus didn't yet walk the earth. We understand that, right? 171 BC, we're 171 plus years removed or, or in advance of Jesus walking the earth. And so now as we move through this, what we're going to see is in some ways the Bible is going to be talking about Antiochus, but in other ways it's going to be talking about Antichrist. One prophecy talking about two different periods of time and two different people. Now, before we start thinking, well, that's kind of weird, that doesn't happen anywhere else in the Bible, it actually does. In Ezekiel chapter 28, God sends Ezekiel to speak against a king. The the, the king's dominion is is in a place called Tyre. He wasn't the king of a Tyre, okay? Like a round rubber thing, all right? He's the king of this land, this area called Tyre. And you can read in Ezekiel chapter 28, and God is passing judgment on the king of Tyre, but then all of a sudden in the middle of it, it says you were in the Garden of Eden. What? The king of Tyre was never in the Garden of Eden. You exalted yourself, Ezekiel 28 says. You were God's created being. You were beautiful in what you did, but when, I'm paraphrasing here, but when pride entered your heart, you fell. What what just happened? One prophecy talking about both the king of Tyre and Satan himself. Here we are in Daniel chapter 8. We have this prophecy that we understand is about Antiochus, and now we're going to see it's also about Antichrist. Look with me in verse 20. Here's Here's the near fulfillment. The ram which you saw having the two horns... They are the kings of Media and Persia. We talked about that last week. And verse 21, the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. So now we, we understand all of that. In fact, a lot of that confirms at least part of an earlier vision that Daniel had. And yet Gabriel is speaking about end times things. Gabriel is talking about latter times, last days. So what we just read and what we're about to read, here's where the, what we just read is about Antiochus. What we're about to read is where the overlap comes. Watch, verse 23. And in the latter times of their kingdom, when the transgressors, have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, now watch this next phrase, but not by his own power. So here's what just happened. Gabriel now is beginning to speak to Daniel. You can see Uh, In verse 23, he uses the phrase again, the latter time. It says when the transgressors have reached their fullness. In other words, there's, there's a point when sin is going to peak. That's what transgressors do. They transgress. That's what sinners do. They sin. We sin. And at the peak of that sin someone is going to be able to step onto the scene with power and with authority. But that power is not his own. 
And in Revelation chapter 17, verse 17, it says that his authority comes because everybody else gives their authority to him. Like, oh my goodness, we can't figure this out. So every president, every dictator, every prime minister, every governor just gives their authority to this new king who's on the scene. He doesn't just have his own authority, he has everyone else's as well. This has come up a couple times lately, just as a little aside. There is a lot of division in our world today. Would you agree with me? There's a lot of division in our country today, and even let that trickle down, sadly, into our families. And you name it, that's what we divide over. Coronavirus, masks, vaccines, dolphins versus patriots. I predicted the score last week, Mike. 29 to 9 patriots. I was wrong. So, yeah, I was wrong. But in all seriousness, there's all kinds of things. And it, doesn't it feel like today that if you were to walk outside today and look up and say to a stranger, the sky is so blue, they would say, actually, and launch into something that just disagrees with you. It's division and division and division and division. And I am of the opinion, and that's all I can share with you on this. I am of the opinion that it is the goal of our world to keep us divided. Because keeping us divided will pave the way for somebody to be able to step in and say, you know what? I'll be the one to unite everyone. Because it's not going to be a Democrat and it's not going to be a Republican. Because we ha we've had presidents in our country of both uh, uh, parties. Thank you. You like parties? Yeah. Uh, uh, of both... <laughs> of both parties who have, that's what they've said they're going to do. We're going to be the one to unite the country. We're not a united country. It doesn't matter who's in office. And, and, and I believe that the worldwide powers to be, and by that, by the way, I mean Satan, will do everything that he possibly can to keep us divided. Because why else would nation after nation after nation give their authority to a new king who shows up on the scene. Unless they're at their own wits end. And they just, there's no one left that we have to figure this out. But here comes this new king. Look what it says about him. It tells us in verse 23, near the end, that he'll have fe fierce features. And it also tells us at the end of verse 23 that he will understand sinister schemes. Wow. I don't know about you, but when I think about someone sinister and sneaky and sly and cunning in the Bible, I think of Satan. So now it makes sense in verse 24 when it says his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. As we looked at a couple of weeks ago, there is a verse in Revelation that says that the Antichrist, when he rises to power, will be operating under the power of Satan. His authority comes from other countries in the world, but his power comes from Satan himself. It says in verse 24, he shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Hey, just like Antiochus went after the Jewish people, so the book of Revelation is clear. The Antichrist will also go after the Jewish people as well as any Christian believers who are around during that period of time. Verse 25, it says, through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes but he shall be broken without human means. Wow. Now, there's so much in there. We won't take time to go through it all, but verse 25, cunning, deceit. Middle of verse 25, exalting himself in his heart. 
just like Satan did, according to Ezekiel chapter 28, believing himself, uh, Satan says in Ezekiel 28, or maybe it, it might be the Isaiah passage, um, that he will be like the Most High. And we see here that the Antichrist is even going to rise against someone called the Prince of Princes. And guess who that is? Jesus himself. Jesus himself, who Gabriel ties us to Christ. But then it tells us at the end of verse 25 that ultimately this character, Antichrist, shall be broken, and watch that last phrase, without human means. Uh, the old King James says, without hands. Doesn't mean he doesn't have hands. It just means that there's no human beings who are going to bring about the end of the Antichrist. If no humans are going to do it, guess who's going to do it? God's going to do it. Jesus is going to do it. That's right. Without human means, supernaturally, God gets involved, Jesus gets involved, and the reign and rule of the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, Satan, all dealt with by God himself. Verse 26, our last clue that this is not just talking about Antiochus. And the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told, is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Wow. Quite the vision that Daniel's given. And, and what a heavy one to be given. No one else in the Old Testament is given a vision like Daniel is given. God must have known that he could handle it. It's probably felt to Daniel like, you know, I can't handle this. But God knew that he could. But watch what happens to him at the end of the chapter. Verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. He had no one else that he could go to. Because as soon as he said, man, you wouldn't believe the dream I had. You wouldn't believe the vision I experienced. Oh, Daniel, do tell. Well, there was a ram and there was a goat and then something happened and the horn fell off and then there were four and then there was a little one and it went after my own people and they'd be looking at Daniel like, Daniel, you're nuts. You're, you're, you're losing your mind. You're in your 80s. Maybe some senility is setting in here or something, Daniel. But it so bothered Daniel that he fainted. Not because of the presence of Gabriel this time, but because of the heaviness of God's word in this vision, in his heart. He fainted and was sick for many days. But I want you to notice something in that last verse. That even though Daniel was physically impacted by this vision from the Lord, at some point after a few days, do you see what he did? He started to do what he had always done. He got up and he was about the king's business. He did not take a couple of pieces of wood and some rope and make a placard and paint on it, the end is near, and go stand out on a street corner in Babylon. He just went about his business. But I bet every chance that Daniel had to tell somebody about end time events, he took it. They didn't have to understand it all. He would just tell them, and whatever they understood, whatever they could wrap their minds around, that was sufficient for him as he went about his regular day. He didn't quit his job and start a ministry and expect the, you know, the, the other Jewish people to financially support him. He just went about his life. But as he did, he no doubt shared 
what he's been sharing with us in writing. I can't imagine that it verbally never came out of his mouth. He shared with other people that in fact the end is near. That in fact, like it says in verse 26, the visions of the evenings and mornings, God's word that was given to him, which was told, is true. This book is truth. And we live in a world that acts like our world is never going to end. I mean, we're trying to figure out how to get our planet to last for another, you know, gazillion years or whatever. We're trying to figure out how to get our own lives to last longer. I mean, that's been going on for years, right? I mean, just, you know, injections of this, or, you know, I'm going to be freeze-dried, or I don't think that's the right word, but you understand. That's, I think that's what you do to fruit or something, right? Yeah, not to people. But, you know, uh, cryo, cryogenics, is that what it's called? Yes? Oh, good. Too many of you knew the answer to that. That's kind of weird. Um, and, and, and all these different things to, to make life better and to live longer and all of those different things. But listen, every day that goes by, we're one day closer to the uh, uh, activities of Scripture and the visions and the dreams playing out because they're true and they're real. But I want to tell you something. What we need to tell the world, even when we talk to them about end times things, is that you and I are not waiting for the Antichrist. We're waiting for Jesus Christ. That's the name that needs to be on the edge of our lips, even when speaking about end time events. That's the tie-in that we need to make for people. This isn't like, oh my goodness, build a bunker, collect canned goods like Joy Lund does, so that in case anything bad, I'm not suggesting that you have a bunker, by the way. So, and, and so that if any, when the bad stuff starts to happen, we all have somewhere to go. I've got somewhere to go. It's called heaven. And I'm planning on going there in the rapture. That's the hope that we need to be sharing. What hope is saying, collect food, build a bunker. That's not hope. That's not hope at all. That's not what we need to be telling the people in our world. What we need to be telling them is there are some really bad, terrible things that God's word says are going to happen in the last days. And all we need to do is pick up a newspaper or bring them to a, a, a news website on our phone or whatever to show them it's already started. It's already going on to then present them with the hope of Jesus Christ. Yes, talk about the Antichrist, but talk more about Jesus Christ. Yes, talk about the beast or the false prophet or, or where the power is going to come from or the division that's in our world today, but end by talking about the one who brings unity. The one who says, uh, it says in Ephesians 2, right? Uh, or Ephesians anyway, he himself is our peace who has broken down every wall of separation and my paraphrase united us jesus does that only jesus so so maybe this a little bit this morning felt like wow this is kind of like an end times lesson and i didn't mean for it to feel that way that's why we talked a little bit about the way you and i speak as those who are seeking to be holy and maybe challenging what we believe to be true previously about angels compared to what Scripture says. But most of all, we can read these things and see these things and have an understanding of these things to a certain point. But our, our goal is not, to, is not to be pining for this, longing for this. It's to be longing for for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, how we thank you for your word. Lord, there are some times in your word, and, and this may even be one of them for some of us, when we are seeing with our eyes and yet not understanding with our minds or our hearts. So we, may we not just see, Lord, may we also seek. Rather than closing our Bibles 
and sometimes, Lord, at the same moment, closing our hearts and minds to what you want to reveal to us about the meaning of something, may we push in towards you. May we, may we seek the answers through your word and by your spirit when we do not understand. And as we do so, Lord, as we live in a very unholy, divided world, may we not be the cause of division. May we not be the carriers of division, even if we don't initiate it. May we, in fact, Lord, be ones who when people hear our voice, they know that holiness is part of our lives. It's very hard, Lord, for us at times to talk to people about hell and damnation if they've heard us throw those words around in other contexts before. But they're real, both hell and and damnation. So help us, Lord, to live a holy life. And for those of us, Lord, in this room, and we have some because every church does who are, who are just real prophecy buffs and get all wrapped up in the prophecies of Scripture, Lord, may we understand that the point of prophecy is Jesus Christ. We don't need Gabriel showing up to us to understand that, Lord. So we, may we not be guilty of studying the Word and missing the Word completely at the same time. We thank you, Lord, that you warn us in advance because you love us. That even this day, Lord, we have the opportunity to say, you know what, man, I don't fully understand everything that's going on, but I understand enough to know it's not going to be good. Fierce features, schemes, cunning, deceit, division. And may that prompt us to say, I want to make sure that I'm right with God. I want to make sure that I'm in right standing with the Lord if this is all coming down. And may we understand today, Lord, that to be in right standing with you is simply to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. He is not just the one we are waiting uh, for his return. He is the one who is to lead our lives every single day. So, Lord, if there is anyone here today who doesn't know you in that way, you're just an occasional thought in their minds, however we would describe it. May today be the day that they come to you and say, God, I need you to be God in my life. Jesus, I believe in what you did on the cross and I don't just need you to be a Savior, I need you to be my Savior. We pray, Lord, for those who would say that to you even today. Lord, as we worship you now, may we worship you and praise you for everything that got mentioned earlier in the service, and now everything that you've opened our eyes to in your word. In Jesus' name. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock.
now I know I love you I need you though my world may fall I'll never let you go my Savior my closest friend I will worship you until the very end Jesus lover of my soul Jesus I will never let you go you've taken me from the miry clay set my feet upon the rock now I know I love you I need you though my world may fall I'll never let you go my Savior my closest friend I will worship you until the very end
God, my rock. Lord, would you be that for us this week, Lord? Our rock. As the old hymn says, Lord, all other ground is shifting sand. And my goodness, do our weeks sometimes feel like it. It feels like we just can't get our footing. But you who give us your truth, encourage us to stand on that truth. Thank you, Lord, for being our rock. May we rely on you that way this week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Listen, if you need prayer for anything this morning, Mike and Lynn Davis will be up at the front. Come pray before you leave today.